When you come up to the mic, please state your first and last name for the record, and then we're asking people to keep their comments to one, two minutes, so that we can get through as many as possible. Um, and I'll just come up and call the people as we go. Thank you. I'm Mark Brown from Marshfield. It's just outside of Machias. And uh, I have a message for Secretary Zinke that the, the coastal Washington County relies on the ocean for its livelihood, and uh, we are we are opposed to the drilling because it's a major threat to our survival, and it's also a major threat to the fragile e ecosystem out in the Gulf of Maine, especially the, the, the deep water coral reefs that, that are out there that are very unique. So please, Senator Zinke, don't, don't authorize drilling off of the coast of Maine. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lindsay Sterling, and um, Drilling in the National Outer Continental Shelf is not going to make us a stronger nation. It will make us a backwards nation. What would make us stronger would be to develop new technologies that provide, that provide power without causing global warming. This is the technology that the world wants and needs. So let's develop it. Let's put our energy there. We want to become energy independent. So support companies and movements that get us off oil. We look, out, we look out from our coastlines today and we see beautiful scenery, we see pine trees, glittering oceans, fishermen, lobstermen, oyster people, recreational boaters. We see a future that makes us happy and a future that we're proud to be a part of. It would be torturous to look out to see giant industri industrial complexes that are actively causing our seacoasts to be submerged polar ice caps to melt, and mega storms that are ruining lives. Please join me in saying no to dr oil drilling in Maine and all, the National Outer and all the National Outer Continental Shelf. And I just wanted to share that for those who were not able to be present at the Civic Center today, you can go to um, a website to submit your comments to the um, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. So it's really easy, you just go to your computer. I'll give you a moment to get your pencils at home if you're there. So the website is regulations.gov. There will be a search box and you type in the initials for the Bureau, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. So you type in the search box BOEM-2017-0000 Please invite, invite your friends to do this. Um, do it yourself because we need to make sure that our voices are heard. I'll give you that one more time in case you didn't get it. It's go to regulations.gov and in the search box type in BOEM-2017-0074 and there's a little button that says comment. Please do it. Thank you so much. Hi, well, I'm Richard Nelson. I'm speaking today believing I can offer a rather unique perspective from one who has been both a commercial lobster fisherman for over 30 years and has also been one who has kept informed and involved with ocean energy issues <coughs> and their effects on coastal communities. Through that time, I've served on Maine's Ocean Acidification Commission as well as Maine's Regional Ocean Plan Planning Advisory Group, working to advocate for both the ocean itself and the sustainability of Maine's unique small boat fisheries. I've made my living, however, fishing out of friendship, a small village in which approximately 250 of its 1,100 residents hold commercial fishing licenses, and two of its three visible businesses are a boat shop and a lobster trap manufacturer. Although it's certainly rare to find a town's existence so dependent on a single sector for their livelihood, we repeatedly find that here along the coast of Maine and on the islands. We, <clears throat> those local economies that are almost entirely reliant on a healthy ocean and its resources. I've often told planners, fishermen need two basic things a healthy resource to fish on, and to have that resource remain accessible to us. I believe any effort to exploit the oil and gas reserves along our coast would jeopardize both of these, and thereby the very existence of our fishing communities. It threatens the health of our fisheries resources both directly 
through the damage to ecosystems caused by oil spills and the increase of the industrial traffic and surrounding infrastructure, as well as indirectly by being an integral part of and surrounding <coughs> and continuation of our fossil fuel dependency and its effect on our climate. The effects of increased atmospheric CO2 has resulted in the Gulf of Maine becoming warmer, more acidic, and with more severe weather events resulting in increased heavy precipitation and changes in salinity. We have seen commercially valuable species such as cod and shrimp disappear from our region as well as more anomalous and invasive species showing up. Research efforts are now underway trying to find out the full effects of acidifying waters on the entire range of the ocean's food chain, from the smallest of creatures to the whales that rely on them for their sustenance. The very lobsters I seek to harvest are finding their preferred habitat shifting towards cooler, deeper waters offshore and in the direction of Canada. None of this bodes well for us as fishermen. As to the second point of accessibility, we would lose on two fronts as well. Loss from the fishing grounds themselves at the drilling and lease sites will be inevitable, as well as the transportation and pipeline routes to and from these sites becoming prohibitively difficult to fish. Secondly, we would stand to lose a good part of our working waterfronts. An important part of that accessibility we now already fighting to maintain. Lost to the shoreside infra infrastructure needed for the development of oil. Our fisheries here in Maine have helped sustain us since well before we became a nation. And with a little conscientious management and sound climate policies, we'll continue to do so for some time. The profits from these endeavors stays right here on our own communities. We see no need or reason for the leasing of our oceans and the potential livelihoods to either foreign or domestic energy corporations. Trading in our sustainable natural economy, natural resource economy, our environment, our climate, and all they provide for us for someone else's short-lived profits is not an option here in Maine and never was. Thank you. Okay, my name is Mel Melanie Lantod and I'm representing the Maine Unitarian Universalist State Advocacy Network. I don't have anything new to say, but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> Um, oil, oil drilling off the coast of Maine, or anywhere else for that matter, is a terrible idea. For the sake of our, the inhabitants of our planet, enlightened countries everywhere are moving as fast as possible away from polluting fossil fuels to sustainable energy sources. Maine's governor, Paul LePage, is the only governor of a coastal state choosing to support this outmoded policy of offshore drilling. Had our governor been in office 100 years ago, he would have been trying to lure buggy whip companies into the state. <laughs> <laughs> Offshore drilling could be especially devastating to Maine's economy. Tourism, attracted in large part to our pristine coastline, is currently the third largest industry in growing. Another significant portion is fishing, especially lobstering. It's obvious that an oil spilled, spill would have devastating effects. Just because President Donald Trump and Governor Paula Page want to profit as the world burns does not mean that Maine and the nation cannot move forward to a future based on clean, sustainable fuel. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Burke. I'm a resident of Washington, Maine. Um, my comments reflect the strong belief that BOEM should not sell oil and gas track leases in the North Atlantic OCS region. Much of Maine's economy, fishing, tourism, and boating, and culture revolves around the sea, as we all know. Please do not put at risk our existing and bountiful resources and trade for the short-term gains brought by oil and gas extraction activities. Oil and gas are not sustainable energy commodities. We as a state and country need to rely less, not more, on fossil fuel use in order to reduce our contributions to climate change and to minimize adverse public health and environmental impacts. The emphasis for Maine's energy future needs to be a focus on a sustainable mix of energy derived from coastal wind, tidal, biomass, and solar energy. 
wind energy prototypes for offshore placement are now being developed for the Gulf of Maine, and this area has been called the Saudi Arabia of wind due to its high potential. I think that was Angus King who said that. In addition to the well-documented high ecological risk of drilling and transporting offshore oil and gas, there are also less obvious onshore impacts which need to be considered. I'm referring to land-based and adjunct facilities and processes necessary to support offshore extraction activities. These would include industrial development of strategically located shoreline areas such as Sears Island, Eastport, or other locations to serve fabrication, chemical storage, pumping, and other handling and processing. My belief system also informs me that humans are but one part of the ecological system to coexist with rather than dominate over the rest of Earth's creatures. We need to improve our role as steward of the planet. Oil and gas extraction are neither sustainable or sensible in areas of great ecological risk such as coastal Maine. I request that Bohm drop the coastal North Atlantic areas from those locations being considered for leasing. Thank you. My name is Fern, pause, Stearns. Um, last month, scientists reported that for the first time ever recorded, the temperature at the North Pole is above freezing. Repeat, North Pole, above freezing, middle of the winter. Most creatures are smart enough to avoid fouling their own nests, but we humans have been polluting our nest, our planet, with carbon emissions for so long that our climate is changing. Our planet is warming fast. Repeat, North Pole is above freezing. And what is our government doing about it? Well, our government should pass legislation to charge fossil fuel industries a fee for their garbage disposal, carbon emissions. But instead, our government our so-called president, whose name I refuse to utter, proposes that drilling for oil be allowed in the Atlantic Ocean. In other words, burn more oil, emit more carbon, warm the planet even more than now, repeat, the North Pole is above freezing, and add chaos off the main coast to the chaos that now exists in Washington, D.C. No, 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 we cannot let that happen. I have kind of a unique perspective because I grew up fishing on Long Island in New York, and I've also fished in the Pacific, in Oregon, Washington, and Alaska, and I've seen what uh, fuel extraction has done to Alaska, and all of you probably remember the Exxon Valdez, you have a beautiful coastline here. We live in Pembroke in Washington County. And Cobbs Cook Bay is one of the last pristine areas around here. And to allow people to come in and foul that, God must cry when he watches us. Human beings are the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and it's to even make a proposal like this is almost stretches our cred credibility as human beings. And I just I don't believe I'm hearing this. Corporations have no soul. A corporation will do anything it can for profit, and we will be the last thing. If they foul these waters and ruin this beautiful coastline, they will be laughing all the way to the bank. So yes, I propose, uh, oppose this vehemently. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Sue Stableford. I live in Brunswick, and I'm also the vice chair of the Brunswick Rivers and Coastal Waters Commission. We are charged to do quite a few things, but one of the main things that our responsibilities entail is to assure the clean future of Brunswick's coastline for future generations. We actually have 66 miles of coastline in Brunswick. We depend on it for all the economic benefits that have been repeatedly mentioned here. Fishing, shell fishing, aquaculture, etc. We also depend on it as an educational opportunity for students in our high school as well as at Bowdoin College. And we frankly depend upon it for fun. 
So I haven't heard too many people talking about just enjoying the water for fun this afternoon, so perhaps I will mention that. We have lots of people that kayak, that sail, that swim off our coast, and we want to continue to be able to do so. So my response to the proposal to drill oil off the coast, absolutely not. Thank you. So uh, my name is Jasmine Labardi. Um, and why is this proposal a thing? Why is the administration wanting to open 90% of the U.S. waters to drilling? Why aren't we moving away from oil? We need to invest in alternatives and renewables, not continuing our dependence on oil. The risks far outweigh the benefits. We need to think of our future generations. No new oil drilling. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nina Duggan. I'm a college student here in Maine. I've spent the last four years studying seabirds, ecology, and environmental law. Drilling off the coast of Maine threatens at least 12 different species of seabirds. 95% of Arctic terns nest on four islands in Maine. 95% of roseate terns nest on two islands in Maine. All razorbill nesting sites in the U.S. are on six islands in Maine. These birds are already threatened from climate change effects and are significantly threatened by offshore drilling. This threatens birds, marine mammals, fish, people. We don't need fossil fuels, but we need our oceans. Thank you. Hello, my name is Catherine Rhoda. I live in Hiram, Maine. I also am, feel very connected to Monhegan, an island 10 miles off the coast of Maine where I have worked since I was 18. That was a long time ago. <clears throat> in the hope perhaps a vain hope of reaching the hearts of the decision makers in this process, I want to share two brief musical quotes. The first is from a song called Deep Water Horizon Disaster from Beverly Woods. You can look up it up in its entirety on YouTube. I'm just going to quote a couple lines. Like many other people, we all think we'll beat the odds. But money, oil, and power are unforgiving gods. Oil is our addiction. I can see it plain. And death is always hanging round where the needle meets the vein. And from Frankie Armstrong, a song called Mother Earth, just a little clip from it. I am the lakes, the rivers, the seas. All creatures born must drink of me. Remember, I give you birth. Remember, Mother Earth. Why can't you see, feel, and why can't you see? You kill yourselves if you kill me. Remember, I give you birth. Remember, Mother Earth. Thank you. I can't believe that we even have to be here talking about this subject um, when we already have our oceans under severe stress and our climate under severe stress. Why, are we, why is this even an issue? I mean, we know that oil is just contributing to global warming. It doesn't matter, you know, how many scientists you fire and how many things you take out of written documents. Um, it's there. It's the truth. Um, and also, I come from a background that lives off the water in Maine. Um, I have a, a very extended family from Stonington, Deer Isle, to Booth Bay, to Hancock, who were part of the lobster industry in one way or another. And, you know, to even go for oil when we know what it'll do and then let it, one accident happen and destroy everything that is coastal Maine is just, it's, I find it devastating and I find it keeping me up at night because it, it really bothers me that we even have to do this. You know, why do we have to deny what the truth is, like the previous one just said, for profits? That's basically what it is. Um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> 
an aspect of this administration that just astounds me is that they are so blinded by the greed that they can't understand that cause and effect is a fundamental law of the universe. They just don't get that. They are so blinded. <clears throat> and I'm, you know, I've loved everything that everybody has had to say, but I just wanted to highlight one little bit of the picture that nobody else has really focused on, and that is we already are, you know, the, the sort of exhaust pipe for a lot of the pollution blowing in from the west and the south. Um, the uh, process of extracting the oil will, you know, add a lot of carbon to the atmosphere. What, what does the NRCM say? It's like um, uh, 7,000 uh, pounds of, of, of 7,000 cars driving 50 miles a day is, is the amount that it would add of carbon to the atmosphere. But um, I moved here from Albany County in New York State two and a half years ago, where I was a member of the effort to stop fracking from coming into New York. And I have been to, to um, uh, Susquehanna County in Pennsylvania, where they're just fracking the guts out of the place. And it's, it's, it's terrifying. One night there, and I, my uh, respiratory system was so affected that standing away, you could hear every wheezing breath, and there was stinging um, pain in my sinuses, my eyes, my throat, um, and down into the trachea. I, it was unbelievable. And if they do that here, it's not only carbon. There's a witch's brew of horrible chemicals that will be released into the environment and very much in the air because they, as near as possible to the sources of the frac wells, they build compressor stations. And of course, when the, the, the gas comes up out of the ground, it's mixed with the water that they force down in to smash the rock that's filled with chemicals um, that, that have never been analyzed because there was a, a tricky, tricky provision in an in a energy bill in 2006 called the Halliburton loophole. But anyway, it comes back up. The, the gas comes back up mixed with water that's spoiled forever and with all these chemicals. And somehow, in order to sell the gas, then they have to separate the water and the chemicals from the gas to make it saleable. So they do that with compressor stations that are built as, as close as they can manage to the frac well sites, which would probably be towns along the coast. So those emit, not, there's a byproduct of, of, terror, of water that's been spoiled, but there also are vents and smokestacks and you look at it, because I've seen them, and it looks like heat waves coming up out of the smokestacks. Um, in in um, Josh Fox's film, Gaslands, he, he photographed that emission with an infrared film. Yes, there's tons of stuff coming into the environment. And it includes carcinogens and endocrine disruptors. And we just don't need that. <gasps> Thank you. I, I agree with uh, virtually all of the sophisticated uh, presentations. And um, I'm Charles Spanger from Scarborough, uh, the 350 Maine, and the Scarborough Climate Action Team. And I simply want to say that uh, uh, this is, to me, the uh, among, among a few other things, is the represents the crisis of our democracy, and that uh, if we're going to sustain our way of life and our our uh, cultural and economic and spiritual destiny, uh, you know, our ability to have any control over our lives, uh, we have to stop the fossil fuel industry from ending our lives. Thank you. I'm Linda Houghton. I wasn't preparing to speak, but I have to. We all know <laughs> the oil drilling is all about profits for big oil. Um, so let me just share my personal experience. Many, many years ago, I had a small part in cleaning up a crude oil spill. You can never clean that stuff up. If that were to spill on our coast, Maine would never be the same. We absolutely must be opposed to drilling off our coast. And the other thing, just a thought from many, many years ago when I was a Brownie troop leader in Girl Scouts, 
the one simple thing we are all taught is you always leave a place better than you found it. Good afternoon. My name is David Wood. I live in Hollowell. And uh, we, should, we must stop expanding any uh, drilling operations in the Atlantic Ocean and other new places. Uh, I grew up in Cape Cod. If you know, if you've been to the I've been to Cape Cod National Seashore, 40 miles of pristine beach, which could be in threat, like a lot of other beaches down the East Coast. There are, tourism is a multi-million dollar industry, and in oil drilling or spill could, but could harm that. Um, I got to talk about my son. My son owns a company called Ocean Data Technologies Incorporated on Cape Cod. He's been around the world working for oil companies. He's been to Indonesia, Scotland, Australia, the Gulf of Mexico, other areas around the world. What he does is ocean uh, data acquisition measurements in the ocean for currents, turbidity, temperature, and other things in the ocean for the oil companies so they can design their pipeline that goes from the oil rig to the ocean floor. And, and I, he's not here today because he's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on a Russian research vessel today. But anyway, he said there's a high risk in this business, and, the, and it's not worth the risk for us. No oil is worth the risk for a major disaster. And the, potentially, the potential is high for that, that to happen on any oil rig. The weather out there is not always cooperating with the oil people and so on, and he's been on the oil rigs where they had to evacuate people because the water is so rough and the conditions so bad. Thank you. Hi. Um, I come from Brooklyn. Uh, it's a little town on the uh, eastern fringe of the uh, mighty Penobscot watershed. Um, I just wanted to ask for my own information, whether anyone here has heard how the proposal to uh, create a Port Authority designation on uh, the town in the town of Bar Harbor uh, evolved. I, I heard that that uh, proposal was before the uh, the legislature a couple weeks ago, and uh, nobody's aware of whether that was granted to Bar Harbor or not. Yes, sir. It was voted in. That makes me very concerned because I suspect that uh, looking into the future, as uh, we're not very trained to do, uh, but others are, uh, Port Authority designation in Bar Harbor has a lot more to do with this uh, proposed exploration and development than it does with the uh, docking of tour ships. Uh, and I think we need to watch it really closely. I, I'm going to read a little excerpt from a letter I sent some time ago to Mrs. Uh, Hammerly, Kelly Hammerly, the uh, program manager for BOEM. I, I had a talk with her. Uh, she's very easy to get a hold of down in uh, Sterling, Virginia, where the offices are of the, the Bureau. She was a little put out because they just went through this whole process uh, and uh, thought they had it done, only to find, uh, you know, one or two months, I believe, into the uh, elapsed uh, time frame that it had to be done over again. Uh, I, I wrote to her, uh, the people, I, I, I'm, I'm just a guy. I, I don't, I'm not a fisherman. I'm, you know, retired sort of... Uh, uh, carpenter, I guess you'd say, a handyman. The people I would speak for are many who are either unaware of this chance to comment or whose verbal skills limit their ability to so comment. We are not affiliated into corporate interest groups eyeing monetary gains from any future development. Many of us, in fact, have not yet even been born, for this development will affect many generations in, in ways as yet unforeseeable and also in historically referenced ways, which you and I both remember, the Valdez and the rupturing of the, the uh, 
rig there in the Gulf. Uh, let me state clearly that I and those others, both, are and will be adamantly opposed to any exploration and development of the resources of our North Atlantic outer shelf. I could as well call it the ripping or raping of the geological body of this planet, home to us all. This technological so-called development of Earth's resources at the current rate is simply unsustainable. Any good tribal elder would have called a halt to it long ago, referencing the inland panorama, the land contained lovingly between these outer shelves. I'd remind you of what has happened to the Ogallala Water Reservoir through development of the vast irrigated corn industry now headed lockstep toward a dead end, which no one can avert or forestall. There's nothing to be gained of any long-term use by any further develop depletion of Earth's yet undiscovered resources of oil and gas. These remaining vital fluids must be left intact within the Earth. Human development has other alternative sources of energy, clean and renewable, and relatively unsusceptible to monopolization for profit. Uh, several of these uh, wind and uh, tidal uh, generating projects is also under the purview of the BOEM, and I would suggest they uh, uh, try and develop those alternatives along at the same time as researching the uh, oil and gas resources. I'm a little un uneasy speaking to a bunch of people who basically feel the same way I do, because <laughs> I don't know who is really listening. Uh, uh, you know, it's, I've learned through a lot of years of trying to pay attention that Usually the people who need to hear aren't the ones who are listening at places like this. And I, I would encourage us all to develop our skills in communication, to try to reach out to the fishermen in our neighborhood, to the people who think differently than we do, uh, who are easily insulted and affected and closed down by uh, our uh, very frequent, I know better than you attitude. Uh, if we're going to be able to talk to more people than there are in this room, we've got to be able to broaden our perspectives and we've got to moderate our diatribe a little bit. So thanks a lot. I'm Representative Ziegler. I represent District 96 in the main house. I sit in front of Bob Alley and uh, Nick Devon, which is a nice place to sit, believe me. I also have another hat. I'm Captain Ziegler. I hold a unlimited master's license in the U.S. Merchant Marine, and I worked 35 years for the National Science Foundation. I have been everywhere. I have been in the Antarctic, the Arctic. I have gone every mile up those east, west coast, central, South America, all over. I have seen off of Australia, what you normally see when you come in is just the lights because they're burning off oil. You don't want to see that off the coast of Maine. It does take away from the pristine quality of it. But the other, there's two issues here. One of the issues is the immediate pollution that would occur conceivably from an oil spill or and or maintaining the rigs. We don't want that to happen on this coast. As I said, we also don't want to see the off-gassing. And just quickly, I'm also in the uh, Environment and Natural Resource Committee, and geologically speaking, you can't frack in the state of Maine. It's just not capable at this point and as far as technology. New Brunswick, there is that. I wanted to address that with the woman who talked about fracking. I think we should be more concerned about offshore drilling. The other issue, and I think is very important, is our policy. We do not have a coherent energy policy. We are not moving away from fossil fuels. When fracking did occur, that moved us back into fossil fuel and our nation depending on that. You need to talk to your representatives. You need to ask the question, what do you support before you vote for them, both on a federal level and a state level. And this is a resolution. And yes, we did vote for this. We do not want to see our state as representatives, as representing you, we do not want to see our state become something like, I'm sorry, but I worked down in the Gulf. I was down there, and I swam in the Gulf, uh, and I had to push the oil globules away. I got a bacterial infection, 
And it's not pleasant. And you don't want that on Scarborough Beach. You don't want that in Jonesport. You don't want that anywhere. So it's up to you folks not just to speak here, but to become a political entity and make sure that you elect people who will stop this on a, on a federal and a state level. Thank you. Hi, I'm Doug Bowen, and uh, my memory isn't quite what it used to be, so I have to ask a couple of questions in the hope that someone's here know. Um, how long ago was the Exxon Valdez oil spill? 1989. Okay. Um, and to what extent has uh, the environment, the shellfish industry, and the fishing industry recovered since then? Partially. Just partially, and it's almost 30 years later. Um, did um, people in the industry and government promise that nothing like this would ever happen again? Of course. Um, after the Deepwater Horizon disaster occurred, have they made similar promises? Of course. Um, is it possible for this kind of complex, dangerous endeavor to ever be safe enough? No. no. That's it. Thanks. Hello, I have a full testimony that I'll um, submit, but I just wanted to say orally that um, like my name is Laura Minixitsky. I'm a biologist at Maine Audubon, and uh, I represent Maine Audubon um, and our three or 30,000 members and supporters, and we stand opposed to opening up Maine's waters for offshore drilling. Um, just, and again, I'll skip the mo most of it, but I do want to say that Maine Aud at Maine Audubon, I work very closely with Maine's coastal communities um, up and down the state, protecting wildlife and Maine's wildlife habitat. Birds like the state endangered piping plover and least terns, they depend on healthy, clean, beautiful, oil-free beaches um, in order to nest and raise their young. Um, tourists and our economy also depend on these healthy, beautiful beaches, and we're lucky to have them. If Maine's beaches become oiled, not only do we lose iconic Maine wildlife, we lose money from our tourism economy and our fishing industry, and more importantly, a, maybe even a way of life, because um, our coast is really, it's an integral part of Maine's history, our identity, um, our culture, and, and our economy. So just uh, no one wants to see, see a charismatic main puffin covered in oil or a lobster boat idle because it can't work. Um, so Maine Audubon, we do say no to offshore drilling on Maine's coast. Thank you. Hello, folks. Uh, Steve Weems. I live in Brunswick. I'm here as an individual today and adamantly opposed to the proposal to open up for offshore oil, oil drilling and in deep grief that this proposal is even before us. I just want to tell two quick stories about why that is. Um, I got to Maine 43 years ago now to look at the, in the aftermath of the 1973 oil embargo, inspired, an oil crisis inspired by OPEC who, who cut back production and got a huge hue and cry about where's our oil and gas going to come from. The BLM responded with a proposal to lease tracks all over the continental shelf on both coasts. This is very painful to be thinking about this 43 years later. And I was brought here by then independent governor Jim Long to look at the pros and cons of this. There were some pro potential pros, you know, economic development, more oil, and there were certainly plenty of cons. Well, six months later, the jury was in. It was an absolutely atrocious idea. We had the legislature, the executive, and the judicial branch in Maine mobilized against it. And then it all just sort of went away. The crisis had faded in memory. There was plenty of oil and gas around the country. And oh, by the way, the uh, the seismic data indicated that there probably wasn't a huge amount of oil and gas out in on Georgia's bank or in the Gulf of Maine. Let's hope that's true. We never even did really kind of confirm that. Um, so 
that was the end of that, although we did have the state completely mobilized against the proposal, and we need to do the same thing again. Fast forward to about, about 35 years to uh, maybe eight years ago, and I'm, I'm in a discussion with Graham Shamil, who was then the executive director of the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, a very esteemed worldwide scientific organization looking at the ocean, and he's talking to me about becoming a trustee. And um, eventually I said, you know, Graham, I'm certainly no scientist. I'm a businessman by training and, and trade. Um, so, you know, I'll never be able to understand the science you guys are doing. Um, why should I, why is this a good fit? And he said, well, all you need to know is that the oceans are in trouble. The oceans are in trouble because of global warming and the evil twin of ocean acidification. And we study that every day, and I can confirm that the oceans are in, are in trouble. And all you need to know, and I want to repeat what Melissa said earlier, all you need to know is that over 60% of the oxygen you're breathing is produced by ocean phytoplankton. And if that's in trouble, everything's in trouble. My name is Claudia King, and um, I'm here reading excerpts from a statement by um, a member of Sierra Club Maine's executive committee, Becky Bartovix, who can't be here today. She's recovering from orthopedic surgery. Um, but her statement is on behalf of more than 18,000 members of supporters of Sierra Club Maine. Sierra Club Maine adamantly opposes the proposal by Secretary Zinke to open the Outer Continental Shelf to seismic testing and drilling for fossil fuels. The proposal to sell off oil and gas leases on the East Coast, and particularly in the Gulf of Maine, is irresponsible. It is thoughtless and lacks an understanding of the importance of the unique geological, ecological, and historically productive characteristics of these waters. The Gulf of Maine is a highly productive habitat and provides nurseries for a broad array of diverse species. Geological features create the Gulf of Maine gyre, which causes mixing of the waters, which supports ocean life. Fresh water, coastal wetlands, upwellings, healthy seaweed provide nutrients for a broad array of marine life, mammals, and provides livelihoods for people on our coast. Livelihoods that have been pursued for thousands of years. Due to these geological and hydrological features, including the gyre, any oil and gas spill would spread throughout the Gulf of Maine, making it even more difficult to clean up than the 1989 Exxon Valdez spill. Ecologically, species depend on these waters as nursery areas for marine mammals down to the smallest copepods. The gyre allows for this rich environment and makes it much more vulnerable to spills than other coastlines with less internal interconnectivity. Our lives are intrinsically aligned with the resources of these waters. The productivity of the waters is legion. Lobster and crab fisheries provide millions of dollars in our state alone, burgeoning aquaculture, including shellfish and seaweed farms, as well as new fisheries provide a multitude of fishing livelihoods. Associated industries such as boat building, marine processing, restaurants encompass even more jobs. Considering the marine productivity of our economy and its basis on environmental sustainability, this proposed plan has no merit. These waters must not be compromised by oil exploration and development. Any attempt to drill for oil or gas off our coasts will threaten our coastline, communities, marine ecosystems, and our efforts to combat climate disruption. The risks of leaks, spills, and chemical contamination are too high to gamble with the health and economic well-being of our waters. Oddly enough, there is reportedly little to no oil present on the George's Bank or elsewhere in the Gulf of Maine. 
and of grave concern are the devastating effects that seismic testing causes to marine life. Damage to all marine species will have a major impact on our local economies. Seismic testing cannot be allowed. This sort of the, the benefits of this sort of development accrue only to private corporations which have proved careless and destructive of local environments over and over again. The construction jobs they bring are overwhelmingly from out of state and mostly out of region. Even now, the administration has chosen to reduce safeguards and fossil fuel company liability in the case of spills. While this administration is subsidizing the oil and gas industry by opening huge swaths um, of land lease, op land lease opportunities in previously held public lands and proposing the same in our coastal region, the rest of the world is moving beyond the outdated fossil fuels because it is a 20th century technology that has outspent its useful life. It is high time that we look to sustainable energy development instead of spending our resources supporting a dying industry. In summary, the economic, ecologic, and geologic features of the Gulf of Maine and Maine waters in particular are ill-suited to oil and gas development. Subsidizing this industry by opening up these waters, which were closed due to a huge amount of support by regional citizenry, will be benefit only the oil and gas industry. Sierra Club adamantly opposes any exploration or development of oil and gas in the Gulf of Maine and in our waters. My name is John Mine. I'm from Friendship, Maine. And I guarantee you, without any probability of failure, a way to assure that there will be no oil spill to affect all the living organisms that would be influenced negatively by that. Don't drill for oil. Hi, um, my name is Carlos Stoll. I'm an educator and I'm also a native of New Orleans. I'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, I started a nonprofit called One Fish Foundation. It's, its mission is to bring the sustainable seafood message into classrooms from um, elementary school all the way up into college and also into communities via sustainable seafood dinners. It's a chance for people to interact with where their seafood comes from and start to learn um, everything that goes into seafood harvest, distribution, preparation, and why they should care. So when I'm talking to students, I talk about different harvest methods, different aquaculture methods, different ecological impacts of those. We talk about environmental stuff too. We talk about climate change. We talk about the war warming oceans. We talk about the Gulf of Maine. We talk about ocean acidification. We talk about policy. We talk about a lot of things. One of the biggest challenges that I have, particularly when I'm talking to middle school students and high school students, is talking about the environmental things that are happening with climate change. Because when I start talking about the fact that the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the oceans on the planet, their eyes get really big and they start to get concerned. Then I start talking about how uh, migratory patterns of different species are changing. So we're getting black sea bass up here that weren't here for a while. We're having more and more green crabs because they're getting a lot more adapted to um, the winters and therefore they're getting cozy, they're reproducing more, which is having an impact on eelgrass, which is the nursery for a lot of uh, uh, biota, a lot of marine life. Um, they also affect uh, clams and larval mussels. But it's trying to keep that hope for them, you know, and trying to say that, well, there are things that we can do to try to adapt. We have to adapt. We're not going to fix climate change. That's one of the things that's just a reality. Also, you know, telling them that, well, climate change has a long memory. You know, what's going on now is 50 years from now. We're not going to change what happens in the next 50 years because of climate change. As somebody from New Orleans, born and raised there, when I saw this going on, it just about brought tears to my eyes, seeing this big black blob, brown blob, spreading out in the Gulf of Mexico, because I knew 
that the implications were going to be significant. So I guess my point is this. We got enough going on in the Gulf of Maine with ocean acidification, with the warming waters, with changing currents, which have huge impacts on where lobsters go, where northern shrimp go. We don't need this. We definitely don't need that. And the other thing I'll say real quick, um, somebody said something about preaching to the choir. Yeah, we're preaching to the choir today, sure. But it's the choir that sings the loudest. And we have to keep spreading that message. We have to keep doing that because otherwise, this way, the way the administration, this administration works, something else is going on, don't pay any attention to what's going on over here. We gotta change that dynamic. Hello, I'm Rachel Goldberg, and I have lived my whole life in the beautiful state of Maine. I grew up as a child of the mountains in the western Maine before being formally introduced to the oceans three years ago when I moved to Mount Desert Island to attend College of the Atlantic to study climate justice and environmental policy and science. Although I have fallen in love with the power of the ocean, I cannot speak as beautifully as those who have shared sediments from their experiences with fishing and recreating on the ocean, which is reason enough to not allow offshore drilling. Instead, I draw on the experiences from the past three years of my studies. During my time in college, I have had the great fortune to attend two UN climate negotiations in which I was forced to acknowledge the urgency of the climate crisis head on. I like to think that most people aren't climate deniers, but in denial. Denial that we'll have to make sacrifices to our ways of life and that we can no longer allow quick profit for people in power to be the primary driver in how we make our decisions as a state, nation, and world. It is widely agreed that a global average of 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming above pre-industrial levels will devastate communities, increasing the number of climate displaced individuals and the frequencies of unprecedented natu natural disasters. The list of adverse effects of climate change can go on and on, and we could talk about it all day probably. But we have already allowed 1.1 degrees Celsius of warming as of now, and according to the most recent report from the International Panel on Climate Change, it is expected that we will reach 1.5 degrees of warming um, in the next 10 to 12 years. When projects such as this one are proposed, we are responsible as a state and the country with the largest historical responsibility for anthropogenic climate change to stare greed and destruction in the face and say, no, this simply won't do. I ask our governor, our president, and Secretary Zinke to look around them. This is not the time to be installing fossil fuel infrastructure. This is the time to be making the rapid transition away from extractive industry to renewable energy in order to ensure a livable world. Thank you. Well, I'm giving my testimony today in honor of four of my five grandchildren who have many fond memories of being able to uh, recreate on the coast of Maine uh, without uh, getting blobs of oil on their feet um, or on their bodies. Um, when I first heard about the proposal uh, to drill for oil off the Atlantic coast, my reaction was, are they insane? That opinion has not changed based both on my personal experiences living on the coast of Maine since 1970 and working to protect our marine waters and waterfronts in different professional capacities. My concerns also extend further into my personal history and down the coast to New Jersey Shore, where I spent 18 summer vacations in my youth. The question I keep asking is, are we prepared to sacrifice an ecosystem that has saved that has sustained life here for millennia for a few drops of oil or gallons of natural gas just to keep the lights on and homes warm for a few years. And I say, not I. On Long Beach Island, I remember uh, as a kid in the summer that uh, we'd come off the beach and uh, my feet would be covered with tar and uh, disgusting 
<laughs> oil. Um, and um, my father would clean my feet with a rag and gasoline. And I was thinking about that this morning, how what a terrible smell it was and what a horrible experience for a little kid who had just been enjoying the beach. My family told me it had come from ships that had been sunk during World War II and had washed up on the shore. In the 1990s, I was fortunate to work for Friends of Casco Bay and had the privilege to write a number of grants focused at that time on restoring polluted clam flats to harvestable conditions. Much of the research and actual clam seeding work was done by volunteers as the Friends of Casco Bay staff worked to identify non-point source pollution and take measures to address that problem. And we could see exciting progress with this effort. Then came the Julienne oil spill into Portland Harbor and the Four Rivers in 1996. And I will never forget that day. All of us staff were pressed into immediate service, donning hazmat suits and booties and walking the tidal flats upstream from the spill and beyond and searching for oiled wildlife. After that, many of us went through state training to be oil birds recovery volunteers in the event of, <coughs> excuse me, of a future oil spill. I remember thinking of the vulnerable clam flats we had spent time and energy uh, restoring to productivity that could suffer a large setback with this spill of nearly 200,000 gallons of heavy oil and diesel. All in all, thanks to rapid response with booms in volunteer labor, the damage was not as far reaching or economically, environmentally devastating as it could have been, with cleanup costs only around $443 million. More than 20 years later, what do we really know have been the cost to Maine's marine environment? Costs that may show up even later. So currently, I'm working on a film that demonstrates some of the creative solutions Mainers are employing and or developing to rapidly transition us to a renewables-powered energy system and also to mitigate, adapt to acidification in our coastal waters. I believe that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management could be a partner in these forward-looking endeavors putting your resources into the future life and health of the oceans and planet, and leaving our marine environments free for more drilling for oil and natural gas. The technology is already here, though research into more efficient and cost-effective renewables technology using the power of waves, tides, and winds, that could be a plus. So scientists and public opinion say it's time to put away the fossil-fueled ways of powering our lives and move to renewables that provide not only constant sources of power to all, but also result in the benefits of improved quality of life with healthier air and marine life and economically sustainable livelihoods for people who work in the sea. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Cousins. Uh, I'm from South Thomaston. I've been lobstering for 38 years after I got out of college. And I can't believe we're having this hearing here today on this subject because it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make economic sense. It doesn't make environmental sense. And it doesn't make political sense, except for the fact that it's a political payback from the Republican Party for big oil donations. And that's purely what it is. Let's call a spade a spade. I resent the fact that we have the Gulf of Maine, which is the most pristine environment. It produced the most valuable fishery in the United States a year and a half ago, which was lobster. And it outpaced every other fishery in the United States. 
we have the most valuable fishery in the country in that blocked in area right there. And if we had an oil spill like the Standard Horizon, that's the footprint. Well, that would wipe out one year class of lobsters, absolutely, and probably two or three year classes of lobster. And so my thought is, why would you want to do that to a pristine environment? It just doesn't make sense. I'm not willing to bet my future and my kids, I have three sons who are all lobster and have their own boats. I'm not willing to bet their future and I'm not willing to bet everyone else's commercial fishery in Maine's future for a political payback from an administration that are morons. And I mean, they're morons. I mean, let's call a spade a spade. You look at the news every day, it's unbelievable. If our past administration had done one third of what this one had done, they would be going crazy. So I say probably the only way to fight this is through the ballot box. And you know which side is pushing this. So my feelings are vote the other side. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Bilski and I uh, live in the Mid Coast, Maine community of Bristol. I want to register my opposition to oil drilling along the Maine coast. On any given day of the year from where I live, I can look out and see some mix of harbor seals, harbor porpoises, varieties of gulls, ducks, and shorebirds, as well as cormorants, terns, loons, gannets, etc. Even the puffin, a threatened species once nearly extinct in Maine, is being reintroduced uh, there. Less easily seen, but just as integral to this natural richness are the crabs and lobsters. Numerous saltwater fish and varieties of shellfish, such as clams, oysters, and mussels. Just down the street uh, are the Pemaquid Beach and the Pemaquid Point Lighthouse, major draws for visitors to our region of the coast. From all across the U.S., thousands of tourists and vacationers come here annually to enjoy this abundance of natural beauty, and Maine depends heavenly, heavenly on this uh, tourist economy. Thousands of jobs from Kittery to Eastport support this tourist industry. Equally so, thousands of Mainers are employed in the coastal fishing industry, harvesting a wide variety of healthy seafood for U.S. consumers as well as for global export. The economy of my village is dependent on fishing, primarily lobstering, but also scalloping and other limited fisheries. Needless to say, all of this would be at great risk in the event of an oil-related accident. We all know what an oil spill looks like. Images of death and destruction from the disasters in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010 and Prince William Sound in 1989 are forever seared in our memory. But it doesn't take an accident of this magnitude to keep tourists and vacationers away or to kill off the wildlife that plays a major role in our life and livelihoods. Just a minor oil sheen near the beach or rental cottage would be enough for a vacationer to choose to travel elsewhere not to mention the destruction of a major commercial fishery. No one in their right mind would be willing to risk this. Maine doesn't need offshore drilling. Maine doesn't want offshore oil drilling. Please remove Maine's coastal waters from the na National Offshore uh, uh, Continental Leasing Program. Thanks very much. Hi, my name is Janet Lynch, and I am a member of the Sierra Club Maine, um, but I am here in my capacity as a private citizen. I hold a Master's of Science in Marine Policy and the International Law of the Sea from the London School of Economics. Um, and I live in Pownall, so one town away from the ocean. I have become a landlubber and uh, sort of a landlubber, and one reason is that I also, in 1990, was a student with the Sea Education Association, uh, which sails um, uh, schooners uh, and teaches students about uh, marine biology and history, and we studied the Gulf of Maine. Our onshore component focused on how important George's Bank is to the Gulf of Maine and how it makes um, the Gulf of Maine one of the richest, most productive fisheries on the planet. George's Bank, which is about there, which would undoubtedly be affected by a major oil spill, such as the Gulf Horizon, is essentially a sunken peninsula. And the combination of fresh water from the St. Lawrence and the Labrador current and the, um, the 
Gulf um, Stream, and this bump under the water makes the waters extremely turbulent and extremely productive for many reasons I won't get into. We then got into the boat after our shore component and this was brought home to us rather forcefully as we sailed directly over George's bank and I spent the next month vomiting. And this is why, although I, I, why I decided to study marine policy rather than be out there all the time, but I can tell you from a personal perspective that this is the case and this is extremely Productive. We were also um, the, the the history of this place, as as we probably all know, uh, many cultures from Native Americans to the uh, first Europeans were drawn and sustained by extremely rich rich fisheries and continue to be so. Um, obviously, oil drilling would threaten this entire area existentially and be the equivalent of killing the proverbial goose that laid the golden egg. Uh, it would kill populations outright in a uh, catastrophic event. It would also stress many marine species. As part of my studies at the London School of Economics, I studied um, the North Sea, which, has, uh, which suffers from a great deal of environmental pollution, including oil pollution. Uh, one of the things that we discovered and then I looked into is that uh, there, there was a major die-off of seals not long before I was writing about this. Uh, the proximate cause of their illness, illnesses were, um, they, they had uh, uh, infectious diseases, but um, it's well known by people who study this that animals who are stressed by um, oil or any other pollutant uh, then lose weight, lose vitality, and lose their immune system. Um, and the problems obviously wouldn't be limited to the drilling itself, as has been mentioned by a number of people. Seismic testing is extremely destructive. Anyone who knows anything about cetaceans knows that a deaf whale is a dead whale sooner or later. Um, and additionally, we don't need to be um, uh, putting our money into infrastructure like this, which leads us down a very dangerous path. We are already looking at major uh, climate change right now, which may be advancing uh, more quickly than the models have shown. Um, Right this afternoon, we have another storm. This is not, we don't know the direct connection, but it's certain that the frequency of storms will continue. And the same thing, which makes the turbulent Gulf of Maine productive, because it's stormy and, stormy and turbulent, would also make oil exploration particularly risky. Um, at the same time that we would be making this very ill-considered investment, we, instead we should be investing in solar and other renewables. Um, I have done this myself as a homeowner, but what we need is much more incentivization, which would be much cheaper, both in the short and the long term. Um, and a number of people have talked about many promising alternatives that we can go down um, to pursue this. And this is not pie in the sky. Germany, most of which is above the 50 degree parallel, gets a much larger percentage of its electricity from solar alone. If such a northerly country can do that, surely we can, but we need the political will. And I guess I'd just like to close that in saying, you know, 150 to 200 years ago, the way people the primary means of, of uh, energy or lighting people's home w was uh, whale oil. Um, as whalers continued to hunt whales and they, they became fewer in number, they went further afield with greater risk and, and greater expense going all the way out to the South Pacific. Um, and it just, it stopped making sense in addition to being incredibly environmentally destructive. And I feel like the fossil fuel industry is the whale industry of the 21st century. And it is time that we make the investment, the intelligent investment, in the future. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Olivia Jolly, and I'm a freshman at COA. And ever since I've gotten to Maine, 
I've noticed the intense emphasis on fisheries and how deeply rooted the way of life of Maine is in such systems. I originally came from Southern California and I didn't see anything like that there. This is a whole new breed of um, investment in these um, economic systems. And in my marine biology class, we worked very closely with um, the, sorry, the people at Hadley Mud Flats, and we looked into the provisions already in um, the provisions already in place to protect such fisheries, and they're already in danger even in the advent of the possibility of drilling off the coast. There's invasive species like Carcinus manus who are devastating the mud flats and eating the baby populations of clams. So there's no adult populations regenerating, and Overfishing has also proven to be an issue that's destroying the breeding populations of these species so they can't produce any more for the future of the fisheries. So why are we willing to risk something like the deep water horizon spill when they're already in danger and when this is something they can't recover from because there's already so much that's, that's been lost? And why are we not looking into other alternatives and protecting oil industries that have proven time and time again not to necessarily have the best interest of ourselves and the oceans in mind? The oceans, not to get philosophical, but they give us life, they give us oxygen, they provide us with food. It's amazing how people can completely look over the fact that most of our oxygen and most of our original ways of life were derived from the ocean, and it's kind of terrifying that I personally did not know that there was even a proposition to drill off the coast of most coastal states, or at, if not all of them, until um, I had heard about the initial hearing that was canceled. And I've spoken with friends back in California and in other coastal states. They still don't know. Why hasn't this been publicized, and why aren't we being informed of the great risk that's posed at all of us, because it's not just us here in Maine, and it's not just the fisheries. The ocean is the world, and everyone will be affected. The facts are here, and they're real, so why aren't we facing them instead of ignoring them and protecting things that should be changed? Thank you. My name is Arthur Bell. I'm from Yarmouth. And I'm here not only representing myself, but also the Earth Stewardship Team from the First Parish Church in Yarmouth. It is our belief that we as a people have broken our covenant with God. God had asked us to take care of Mother Earth, and we have not done that. So with that in mind, we believe that climate change is real that our continued reliance on fossil fuels is adding to the uh, climate change. And we also believe that the evidence that we've seen shows that there's plenty of oil reserves already discovered that um, such that as we transition to a renewable energy economy, there's no need for us to be chasing these um, other oil reserves, such as uh, this oil drilling off the, the coasts of um, uh, the whole United States, and in particular, uh, the New England coast. So we categorically oppose this, this plan. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kai Osgathorpe. I'm a junior at College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, I was just upstairs at the official EOEM uh, comment session, and while I was there, I was ensured that my comments would be loosely synthesized and sent off to Secretary Zinke. Um, but I wanted him to know that I was here today, um, and I wanted to share three experiences that I have um, that make me opposed to this proposal. So first, um, I went to school in Hong Kong. Uh, I was there as a high school student at a boarding school, and while I was there, I was um, a scuba diver as part of a team monitoring coral populations and the fish that depend on them. So we would go out every weekend and we would um, measure coral bleaching. Uh, and it was, an apparent, it was very apparent before we even processed any of our data that there was significant coral bleaching all throughout um, Hong Kong's coast. 
um, and that this was affecting fish and that this was caused by warming sea temperatures. And so first, I oppose this proposal because um, I think we just need to be opposing all fossil fuel infrastructure that is causing warmer sea temperatures. Second, last summer, um, I was a commercial fisherman for salmon in Alaska, in southeast Alaska. And I wasn't even born when Exxon Valdez happened, but I now have many friends who were there for it and whose livelihoods were deeply affected um, by this oil spill. And uh, yeah, I want to make sure that doesn't happen here. And my third experience is that now I'm a student in Maine. Um, I've whale watched off the coast of Maine. I live in Bar Harbor. I get to see the ocean every single day. Its pristinity is incredible. It gives me solace um, when I feel hopeless. And um, I just want Secretary Zinke, I want um, the president and all of our leaders to know that I am very opposed to um, drilling offshore. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I prepared a message for the um, Department of the Interior, Ryan Zinke, and government. Um, and uh, my name is Margaret Trull. I live in the Damerscott and Newcastle area an area of great beauty. The people have been working really hard up there, bringing back the alewives, spending a lot of money to bring in the alewives and have the fish ladder. Um, and I've lived in Maine my whole life, so I've seen a lot of changes over the years. And um, I did want to add that they, um, um, Andy Burt mentioned the Julie N, which was an oil tanker that hit the Million Dollar Bridge in 1996. And I had a daughter that was working she was going to nursing school and she was working as an EMT and they called in the National Guard to come and repair the damages and clean up. And the people who were cleaning up that oil spill were so sick. What the EMTs and emergency people did was have to take, take their oxygen level all the time that they were working. So it's very dangerous. And just imagine the strain on emergency services if we had an oil spill, the way it stands right now, if there's a, a boat, just a sailboat or any boat that is sunken off our shore, they call in the emergency services, cordon off the little tiny spill, and that is a huge deal. We don't have a lot of resources in the state of Maine. Um, so the way I look at it is the whole Maine delegation Senators and representatives included is opposed to the federal government's recent plan to allow drilling of oil and natural gas in, ga gas in Maine waters. Scientists, Bigelow, all the universities, they all oppose the use of seismic testing for promoting p petroleum businesses. Seismic testing harms the um, mammals, fish, waterfowl, birds, and all living creatures that support Maine fisheries. Maine stands with other coastal states that value the many traditional uses of ocean coastal waters, such as fishing, lobstering, recreation, tourism, and all of the related legacy uses since the days of the Native American peoples that require clean, safe, and safe waters in our ocean. Because we, the people of Maine, love and cherish our water our oceans and our fresh waters. And the people of Maine oppose any leasing programs proposed by President Trump for the purpose of drilling and blasting for toxic substances, oils, gases, and chemicals in the coastal waters off Maine. The extreme risk of oil spills is too high. For example, as people have mentioned, the 2010 Deepwater Horizon British Petroleum oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Perfect example of a huge disaster. And um, the people believe that this has to stop. Um, we live in a world that is interconnected. Any oil spill anywhere on the east coast of the United States could move up into our waters as well. The scientists have studied this so many times with float cards and other devices. They can launch them from Woods Hole or somewhere else. All those devices come into the Gulf of Maine, and as was described, they get inside the closed off waters of the Gulf of Maine and could get stuck there for years and years. It's not going to flush out if there's an oil spill. And from what I've seen, no amount of insurance money these big businesses could ever pay 
could ever repay damages to the Gulf of Maine. They're not, it's not going to happen. This, I mean, what are they going to do? Put up like a trillion dollars of, you know, to protect us from damages? And even then, nobody would even want the money. We want beautiful, clean waters. So lastly, I would say, I stand here for my children and grandchildren who can't be here, for my parents who can't be here, my parents who witnessed the destruction of Europe during World War II returned to Maine for peace and livelihood for the cherished environment of Maine, to be able to enjoy the beauty of Maine. Thank you. Um, and I vote no to offshore oil drilling. Thank you.